Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of 401 Access Tonight. I'm your co-host today, Joe Carson, joining you from Tallinn, Estonia, where it's pretty dark and cold. Um, I'm the Chief Security Scientist at Thycotic and Chief Advisory CISO for several companies out there. And I'm joined with some awesome guests here. I'm really excited about today's conversation because I think it's really important. I think this is something in the industry we really have to bring forward. We all have to find a way to work together. And I think this is a discussion where that will actually you know, come to light. I'm joined again with my awesome co-host, Mike Gruen. Mike, do you want to give us a little bit of background on what we're planning to do? Yep, Mike Rowan, uh, VP of Engineering and CISO at Cybrary. And yeah, today we're going to be talking to Katie and Casey about uh, vulnerability disclosure programs and bug bounty programs and all sorts of good stuff and why, if you're not doing it, you're doing it wrong. Uh, so yeah, so I'll let Katie uh, introduce herself and then uh, and then Casey. All right. Well, thanks for having me. I'm Katie Masouris. I'm founder and CEO of Luta Security, and we provide governments and large complex organizations a positive roadmap and assessment in how they can build sustainable vulnerable disclosure programs and bug bounty programs. I'm really happy to be here today and uh, talking with you and my good old friend, Casey. Absolutely. So yeah, I, my name's Casey Ellis. I'm the founder, chairman, and CTO of Bug Crowd. Um, basically pioneered the, uh, you know, we didn't invent vulnerable disclosure or bug bounty programs. They predated Bug Crowd's existence, but we pioneered, pioneered the idea of, of bringing in the hard parts and actually delivering those over a platform uh, back in uh, 2011, 2012. So, yeah, it's uh, you know fantastic to be chatting. Uh, obviously, good to good to be catching up with you again, Katie. It's it, it feels like a, a recurring conversation that you and I have had over the past eight years, <laughs> and it's been progress, but there's still more work to do. So this will be a fun chat. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think 2020 has been a year that's been, you know, it's had its goods and bads and lessons learned. I think we've seen a lot of different, uh, you know, disclosures and different things happening. And again, I, I think that 2021 is going to be pretty much, you know, a, a continuous of that. Uh, but I am hoping that we've learned a lot of lessons. Um, so, Katie, you know, you've been, you know, let's say one of the innovators and, you know, really, let's say, uh, you know, Kind of in the front forefront of vulnerability disclosures. Can you tell us a little bit of background about you know what's been happening? You know where do we start and how do we get to where we are? You know I guess it's it's been a long time since you've been involved in it. So can you use a bit of a background and, and uh, what's been happening today? Yeah, I mean I can definitely give a little bit of a quick history of vulnerable disclosure. Um, so uh, what a lot of organizations fail to realize is that the concept of vulnerability disclosure originated with hackers. Um, they're they're thinking that it originated with companies, you know, who started vulnerable disclosure programs early because they were forced to, like Microsoft is a great example. Um, but actually, you know, the the history something different. Hackers basically wanted to alert the public that they were vulnerable to things. Um, and as a courtesy, maybe give the vendor a few days to fix it. Um, the original vulnerable disclosure policies were uh, five-day disclosure deadlines. So, um, you know, we've come a long way from the earliest vulnerable disclosure policies to where we are today, which we have a couple of ISO standards that govern not just the external components to a vulnerable disclosure program, but more importantly, the internal digestive system that has to process all potential vulnerabilities, whether you found them yourself or somebody outside your organization has found them. Um, and, you know, as, as a hacker myself, you know, it shocked me more than anyone when Microsoft, you know, when I worked there, um, asked me to help with those ISO standards. Um, and I got there saying, why would hackers ever want to be ISO compliant? So we, we managed to scope it down to what vendors should do when they're mm -hmm. preparing to receive vulnerability reports and process them. And then we got a couple of ISO standards out of it, which were the basis of you know, some of the biggest programs that we've seen out there. Um, I launched Microsoft's first bug bounty program in 2013. That was really the first time a major vendor besides Google mm -hmm. had offered you know, a big bug bounty and that was one of the big, you know, sort of sea changes that happened that it made it possible for complex organizations to think this through. Now, luckily, my friend Casey was around and had just started this company. And so, you know, folks were catching on to this idea that, you know, hackers weren't necessarily your enemies. Um, yeah. Hackers mm -hmm. could be confrontational, but hackers are trying to do the right thing for the most part because all humans are pretty much trying to do the right thing for the most part. Last time I checked, Hackers are still human beings. So um, kind of wrapping up the quick history lesson, you know, 
brings us fast forward to 2016 when um, when I helped the Pentagon launch the very first DOD program um, embracing hackers, and that was called Hack the Pentagon, first bug bounty program of the U.S. Department of Defense. And, um, you know, the momentum's been growing. It's been great to see. I've seen a few folks and organizations kind of getting a little... Um, a little ahead of themselves in terms of trying to roll out these programs before they really have set their digestive system up appropriately. You don't want to get bug indigestion uh, by any means. But, you know, I think overall, um, you know, the work of all of us, you know, in this community has been contributing to the acceptance of hackers and the idea that, you know, we can be helpful. And especially if you pay attention to what we're telling you, we don't necessarily need to get paid every time, um, although that's, that's good and appropriate. But really, it's it about helps. communication, yeah, mm -hmm. and getting those bugs fixed, and that seems to be the most important thing to all of us. So there you go, mm -hmm. short history of vulnerable yeah. disclosure, and you got and it. I, and I think just yeah. picking up on that a little bit on the bug indigestion. I mean, I think uh, that's a great segue into uh, Casey and Bug Crowd. I mean, we're mm -hmm. uh, Cyber is a yeah. customer of Bug Crowds, and uh, they definitely help us uh, so that we're not choking on uh, all of the all of the constant yeah. reports and, and repeat reports and repeat reports of things that aren't actually problems. So yeah, Casey, do you want to maybe jump in and talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, what, what I'll fit into that, that was a, a fantastic, I think, synopsis of, of yes. kind of, mm -hmm. you know, where we've come from and, and where we are today. Um, where we fit into that, I think, you know, really the two things that, that triggered me to start Bug Crowd, one was, was this awareness of, yeah, you know, the fact that like cybersecurity is a human problem. You know, we're talking about humans, humans being good and hackers being humans too. Humans also mm -hmm. make mistakes. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, there's this, this idea um, that the internet collectively is becoming more aware of. It's the fact that, yeah, vulnerabilities are going to happen um, in spite of all of your best efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and those efforts, you know, vary across organizations to varying degrees, but it's just a part of human nature as well. So, all right, if you've got this helpful group of people that are at the table, um, with the ability to identify risk as a byproduct of that, who are trying to give you information for you to use, you know, that seems to sort out some of the issues that the cybersecurity industry has with a lack of talent and a lack of, you know, the ability to, to really get the right people to answer its questions. So that was a big piece of what I wanted to, you know, solve with Bug Crowd was to be able to plug that latent potential with, with you know, together with the unmet demand uh, to try to make uh, security roll forward in, in, in a better way. The other part of it is just keeping my friends out of jail because um, you know, it, it's this, this sort of origin story. Mm -hmm. I think finding a vulnerability in someone's stuff and telling them about it, it's an inherently adversarial process, um, usually the first time around, especially if, mm -hmm. if the recipient hasn't prepared for it. And if you know the person who's doing the talking might be inexperienced and just going in mm -hmm. you know, a little hot, um, that's a thing that happens a lot. So to be able to standardize and normalize the conversation a little bit um, in order to make it smoother. <clears throat> That's really kind of what we were trying to get sorted out um, with Bug Crowd. And when it comes to, you know, bug indigestion and all those sorts of things, it's, it's really, um, you know, triage is one part of it. I think it's the part of it that gets talked about the most in context of, of a, a public program. Um, because you know you're trying to listen to the entire internet, and it's a noisy place. So, so trying to get this, to the signal through the noise is is very definitely a part of what needs to get done there. I think where I've I've had a lot of respect for the the work that Katie's done was uh, ISO thirty triple one and and those different pieces. What she does with Luda as well is that you know most organizations don't realize how for starters vulnerable they are. Um, but for seconds, ill-equipped they are to actually deal mm -hmm. with information that's coming in from the outside on a reactive basis mm -hmm. and integrate that into their process of building their company. Because they didn't start the company to handle bug reports. They started mm -hmm. it to do whatever they do. So like finding a way to fit that in and have it all roll forward, that's um, it's a very important aspect of it, which is you know something that we we help uh, you know, particularly smaller organizations with and, and the larger ones that we deal with that we've been working mm -hmm. with for longer. Um, but there's a lot of different moving pieces to uh, to the puzzle, I guess, is, is really the point here. Absolutely. I just want to, for the audience, you know, I just want to make sure we, we clarify is that, you know, absolutely. For me, I'm always, you know, beating that drum is that, you know, most hackers out there in the media are kind of misrepresented. Um, yeah. You know, most hackers are there using their skills for good. They're there to help. We're, we're good citizens out there trying to make things transparent, trying to get people to step up and be accountable. And that's ultimately, so there's a misrepresentation I always feel in the media 
and the news that hackers are bad. And I want to make sure that, you know, I myself, I'm an ethical hacker. You know, I'm always looking to make sure that I do things in order to make the world a safer place. And you're using your skills to help organizations and help identify those. So for the audience, when we always talk about hackers, unless there's more context, we're talking about good citizens who's using their skills to help you improve and provide a better service to your customers. And I think what we're really I talking about I, here... I yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, just to jump in, and I'm fully mindful of the fact that I'm sitting in front of a usual suspects. Because <laughs> <laughs> there is this element of, 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 you know, offensive security that is like, you know, one of the things that got me into security in the first place is I really enjoy thinking like a criminal. I've just got absolutely no desire to be one. Mm -hmm. And I think there's the, the, that's been one of the, the triggers or the sources of some of the misunderstanding that's out there. But it's a really good point that you've raised, like mm -hmm. hacker as a phrase became synonymous with the, the, the bad version. Like to me, hacking is actually amoral. It's, a, it's yeah. a thing that you do, it's a mindset, it's a set of activities and, and a set of things, Correct. interests that people have. It doesn't actually have any inherent moral loading. You can use it for good or you can use it for bad. Correct. Um, and yeah. and we, we do the same thing. We try to use the word hacker purely in, in the good context. If we're talking about the bad version, it's you know malicious attacker or a cyber Correct. attacker or something like you, that. You have to, yeah. you, we always have to make sure we put the right context. You know, it's criminal, it's the malicious. I was just going to say, words, right, words are just hard. criminal is fine. You know, criminal. Yeah. That's, yeah. I, I, we've, had, we've had discussions. I, I work in a lot of incident response. I do a lot of penetration testing. And I will always make sure that when we're talking about, you know, I've been working on a ransomware case for, for a number of weeks. And, you know, they're digital thieves, they're criminals, and that we have to make sure that we call the right context, because otherwise what we end up doing is we put them in a pedestal. We put the criminals up there as, you know, elite, as sophisticated, uh, you know, and they like that, they embrace it. So what we're doing is we're, in, you know, we're encouraging them to do more, but we want to make sure we actually call it what it is. It's a criminal activity, it's crime, it's digital crime, and we have to make sure that we get the media to, to pick that and actually use that as a headline. It doesn't make it cool. It doesn't make it, you know, it doesn't make a headline, but we have to get to reality and call it what it really is. Um, I have a question for, for you, Casey, is, you know, one thing is that, you know, I, I'm, I'm definitely a very big promoter of security researchers and finding vulnerabilities. What's the standpoint, you know, when, when you know, they weaponize it? You know, there's a, there's a point of actually finding a bug but then weaponizing it and making that available. What, where's the kind of ethics, uh, where's the kind of boundaries where it should be kind of, you know, staying within the legal side of things? What's what's your you know advice when you do find something, but then you make an exploit that actually will take advantage of it? Yeah, it's it's a it's a challenging question to give a single answer to because mm -hmm. you know half the time weaponization in a good faith hacking context is really about explaining what the nature of the problem is to the recipient, mm -hmm. you know, engineers don't necessarily, um, you know, see an alert one on a, on a website as a POC and <laughs> automatically understand the importance of that. So sometimes mm -hmm. you've got to do a bit of extra work. Um, I think, you know, when it comes to drawing the line around ethics as, as, a, as a finder and as a submitter, yeah. it really does come down to, um, you know, firstly understanding what the expectations are. I think this whole idea of, you know, standardizing vulnerability disclosure brief language and, and all of those different things to make, you know, as much of that like ex, like expectation setting for both sides. Um, you know, as a, as a finder, if I submit to this program, this is what they expect mm -hmm. me to do. I, I'm not forced into that because I'm on the internet and I can do whatever I want. But if I'm engaging, it's going to be most productive if I engage in these sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, probably more importantly, this is what I can re expect in response mm -hmm. from, from, from the recipient. So, if I'm if I'm going and, and making sure that yeah I've, I've weaponized to use your your parlance there um, my exploit in order to explain mm -hmm. it um, you know I know that the recipient is not going to misinterpret that or take it the wrong way mm -hmm. um, it's it's all those sorts of things I mean we're, we're talking about unintended consequences as a service here so it's very difficult to give a, a one size fits all answer to that sure. that's as close as I could get I'd be interested to mm -hmm. see if Katie has thoughts on that too because yeah. she's obviously seen a few goes of this. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, definitely um, creating proof of concept that demonstrates the severity is mm -hmm. is one way to interpret your question, you know, um, in terms of proving it to folks. Um, sometimes, you know, even with a very, very strong proof of concept exploit that mm -hmm. you've developed, 
um, they still misunderstand the root cause and they only understand that one vector that you showed them. Mm -hmm. Right. So they'll fix that one vector. So, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's an important piece. And in fact, in the um, Microsoft bug bounties, which I had created initially, and they still have this criteria, you have to, uh, in order to qualify for the highest bounty amount, you have to produce a working, reliable proof of concept code. So um, the point of doing that is actually showing because Microsoft's defenses, you know, have evolved over time and they're quite sophisticated in the latest operating systems. You have to demonstrate that you could actually leverage that vulnerability to do harm. And that's part of the reward that they're paying for is they want you to do that extra validation step for them so that it's really fast for them to say, yep, that's definitely an issue and get to work on fixing yeah. it as opposed to offloading that work to the receiving team <clears throat> to mm -hmm. either be able to understand it in the first place and get to the root cause, but also to, to be able to address it comprehensively. So I think it's an mm -hmm. important piece. Yeah. Uh, I completely agree. And for me, I, I remember quite a few years, probably about six years ago, I was doing you know a bit of research and I remember one of the things I was doing was basically doing some, uh, taking some previous breaches uh, data and correlating them together. And when in, in, in EU, what that is considered is actually creating a new data breach. <laughs> so because of GDPR and data protection, and it was a bit of kind of, so it meant that you're not in the same, you know, from a legal perspective, you know, getting a slap in the hand from your poll, at least it can inform me not to be doing it. But when you get into those things as well, you know, important, especially when you're working across borders in different countries, um, what do you recommend yeah. security researchers? Because, you know, when I go from different country to country, with I had to choose which laptop to take or which hard disk or which SD drive to, to pop out of my laptop so I'm not breaking laws. Mm -hmm. um, how do we deal with this when it comes into cross-border, especially okay. companies that have different, you know, office locations across the world? What, what's that? How does that challenge uh, put challenge into this? So I can take the first first pass at this one because I helped yeah, renegotiate some of the export controls around you know intrusion software, intrusion software technology as part of the Wassenaar arrangement. So Wassenaar arrangement for those of people who don't know, and thank goodness you don't have to know, um, is basically it's an export control agreement mm -hmm. between 42 countries. It was originally 41, but they added India, you know, in the last couple of years. Okay. Um, so it's a it's a total of uh, 42 countries. So the um, the issue is that at the Wassenaar level, all of these countries decided that they would um, have people fill out export control forms in order mm -hmm. to bring their tools across borders, et cetera. But even in some cases, um, you know, depending on the country, um, even if it was from the same company to a different corporate office in a different country, they might mm -hmm. have to deal with some export controls. So one of the most important things um, for me to get accomplished as part of the official delegation to renegotiate that was to make sure that, you know, incident responders and people trying to do vuln disclosure would not have to borrow, uh, not have to bother yeah. with export control forms and waiting and delays and whatnot. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean that um, every single country that's part of Wassenaar has not also implemented their own more restrictive controls. Mm -hmm. Let's just talk about France and Germany for a second here. You know, they have some of the most restrictive controls, especially around tools. Mm -hmm. um, there was a very famous uh, moment when um, our good friend in the hacker community, mm -hmm. Halvar Flake, also known as real name Thomas Dullian, he was uh, trying to come and bring a training to Black Hat and was denied, um, was basically denied entry mm -hmm. to the country because of what was on his laptop. And so he had to miss the training. Now, fun fact, everybody in their grandpa was try and grandma was trying to impersonate Halvar to get into the Microsoft party in Vegas that year, just, just as an aside, as if we'd never seen him before. That totally know? checks out. Yeah, you know, except, exactly. So this day of export controls almost, you know, got a bunch of gate crashers into the Microsoft party in Vegas. But really, I mean, on a very serious level, mm -hmm. I worked last year back when travel was a reality and I can't even... <laughs> I can't even the, put my head around normal. it. Right. But <laughs> yeah, last year, normal, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were doing an exploitation contest similar to Pwn to Own, and we were doing mm -hmm. it in the United Arab Emirates. Um, and so that was a whole thing where we had to make sure that, you know, essentially the exports themselves, the exploits themselves mm -hmm were contained to just the researchers and the receiving party. We had to have mm -hmm. no, no devices in the room. We had to basically do you know, an impromptu skiff to be able to try and contain these exploits because I knew 
that we weren't uh, export control protected in that place where we happen yeah. to be. And, yeah. you know, the, the exemptions only work if you are the reporter, if you are the receiving vendor, or if you're the coordinator that is going to, you know, kind of work that mm-hmm. arrangement. Now, we were none of those things. We were judges who had set up a contest. So it was really, really tricky. And I'm just glad we all, you know, to Casey's point, we all stayed out of jail. Nobody got fined. Nobody got arrested when they landed back in their home countries. And (laughs) actually, the State Department reached out to me because I did a little little talk about it at SummerCon this year about, you know, how crazy it was. They reached out to me and they were like, we saw your talk. And then they didn't say anything like that. So (laughs) I guess it was fine. I guess they were watching it. I guess it was fine. But yeah, this is super tricky. Last thing I'll say Mm -hmm. about it is that we're never going to get to a true safe harbor for researchers mm-hmm. until we get normalization yeah. across the globe yeah, about exactly. hacking cybercrime laws, you know, anti anti cybercrime laws and export controls. So yeah. we've got yeah. I mean, this is going to be we're going to be very old people, Casey, by the time this is settled. I mean, we're going to be incredibly old. I think you're very optimistic. I don't know about you, but I've aged 10 years in the last 12 months. So there, there, there is that. Um no, and like I, I completely agree with that. The, the, um, I, I don't know that we'll ever necessarily see this get solved, short of, um, you know, any hacking laws and and even things like you know the DMCA, like any circumvention laws, all of the different things that get brought in to to either legitimately or more frequently to chill, um, you know, security research, like legitimately prosecute or chill security research, you know, until those get basically made an afterthought or an addendum to a more traditional crime. Um, mm-hmm. That to me seems to be like a, 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 like a rejigging of the legal construct yeah. that could work, but that's, that's a ways off because, you know, we're still in this place where things are very vulnerable. People don't necessarily, you know, there's not consensus or unified understanding of, of the role of, of good faith hacking as a, as a part of, you know, the overall security yeah. of the internet. Um, there's definitely a lot of good intentions and I feel like there's been a lot of progress that's directionally correct, um, you know, particularly over the past 12 months, but really over the past, you know, 10 years. Um, but yeah, I mean, to Katie's point, I think there's a, there's a long way to go with that. Yeah. What, I, what, I would, what I would add to it as well, just real quick, is the idea of, so we're talking about like physical transit and we're talking about mostly, you know, p- potential like criminal or, or state level legal yeah. risk. Um, on the civil side, yeah, you know, this is where I think uh, it's a part of what we've been really, you know, pushing forward on mm-hmm. uh, the folks that are involved in the Disclose.io project is like, how do we standardize as best as possible um, the kind of things that need to be written in a policy to clearly indicate to the finder that if they, if they do, like if they, if they don't basically do criminal stuff, then, then they're going to be okay. They're not going to be, you know, pursued from a, from a civil standpoint. And that's not perfect, but I think the more, consensus there is the more the more adoption there is of, of those types of terms you know the the kind of the higher the tide rises on that mm-hmm. and i do think as well you know through through combos with people like the eff and aclu and so on like organizations that go to the effort of actually you know enumerating the different things they're going to allow um, from an authorization or access or exception standpoint the more things they've done the less likely they are to actually kind of prosecute by mistake, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So the whole idea of like civil cases being brought under 1030, for example, where there has been a decently written vulnerability disclosure brief is very low because that organization has actually put the time into figuring out what that means. So I think there is an element of that as well. People actually just stopping for a second and working out what the implications of all this are uh, and and moving forward like that. I I, I totally agree. it's a, for me, it's all about the intent. It's it's your intention is for good or intention is for bad. That's ultimately what it comes. You know, the definition is you know whether you're ethical. Sometimes I, we make mistakes. <laughs> so. I, ideally, I don't know the I don't know the law has quite figured out how to wrap its arms around that. And like, if you if you want evidence of that, you just watch the Van Buren briefings uh, yeah. to the Supreme Court. I think even I remember uh, a, that was a, a month ago. Yeah, the Starbucks double double spending one, even the the rewards card. Uh, you know, going through that, and even the guy who did the uh, the PlayStation mod. All of those kind of thinking outside the box about you know how you can do something, uh, and you know, I think you know companies should look to that as as feedback. Uh, for me, yes. it's 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 Ideally. a form of whistleblowing. 
um, for, in my view, and there should be some type of protection, like a whistleblower protection. Yeah, I think so. Itself. So if I could, if I, if I touch on that for a second, cause I can, the dynamic I, I agree with, mm-hmm. um, there's still this like history of it being a very adversarial relationship. And, and I think mm-hmm. like how, how I like to explain vulnerability disclosure in particular, I've heard, heard Katie use this mm-hmm. as well, as well as others is more like the idea of neighborhood watch. Um, like you've got stuff out on the internet. The internet's this gigantic neighborhood. There's people that can identify risk and, and, you know, potentially want to tell you where you might have an issue. Really what you're doing is saying, I'm open to that feedback and I will interpret that feedback as positive. Um, yeah. It, and you can sort of see the difference because it's a form like neighborhood watch is a form of whistleblowing too, but I think couching it in, in more friendlier ways um, really what that does is actually establishes the true nature yeah. of what's going on in a way that helps, you know, ameliorate some of the sins of the past. Yeah, to metaphor it, it's simply your neighbor coming up to your door and saying you left your window open. And that's the form of what it is. And ultimately, if the neighbor says, oh, I'm going to sue you because, yeah, you shouldn't have come to my door. Um, I'm one, you know, <laughs> I don't want- As opposed to the, to the neighbor open. who comes in through the window <laughs> to say you yeah. left your window open, right? Exactly. I mean, yeah, you know what? That, so that's where we get into, into some ambiguity, right? right? Like a lot of times- the way that some some scoping of vulnerable disclosure programs mm-hmm. and bug bounty programs is written is it confuses the hackers and and I don't blame them. So it's, it'll say things like, you know, do your best to show the impact of, right. of this vulnerability. And they're like, so I've got some credentials. What can I do with them? And then they start pivoting all through your network. And that's not what you yeah. meant. Right. So that would be the equivalent of, you know, they think that they're doing neighborhood watch stuff and it's all authorized. But yeah. actually, you've just found them rooting around your underwear drawer and and them saying, what, you told me to tell you like I could possibly do with this access. And I'm like, get out of my house. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So I think a yeah. lot of organizations are yeah. feeling invaded when they haven't yeah. really thought this thing through. So, I mean, honestly, that's a lot of the work that my company mm-hmm. does with organizations is they understand conceptually what they, what they want in yeah. terms of scope, but they have never met some of the scenarios that are fully reasonable scenarios mm-hmm fairly common where a researcher will accidentally or deliberately go out of scope, but it's still not with bad intent. Right. And they have to kind of figure out how are they going to make those decisions and how are they going to, how are they going to behave, you know, um, essentially Mm -hmm. when, when something like that happens, because I mean, a great example is, you know, the DOJ put out guidelines, um, Mm -hmm for how you're supposed to think these things through. And part of that was because of the work we had done with Hack the Pentagon and, you know, mm-hmm. helping to create the ongoing vulnerable disclosure program that was outside of any particular bug bounty time limited challenge where, you know, if you see something, <clears throat> if you see something, say something, you're supposed to come forward yeah. to the DOD. But, you know, we did run into uh, people who were definitely out of scope and, you know, had to coach yeah. the DOD and DOJ in like, nope, this isn't this, this is not it. You're not going after these folks right now. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. But that's why DOJ put out those guidelines to help organizations think that through. And a great example of where they always fall down, mm-hmm. you know, in first first pass is they say, oh, well, we want uh, no data exfiltration whatsoever. And I'm like, yep, but accidents happen. So what are you going to do when somebody actually tells you, I didn't mean to, but I did see data I wasn't supposed to, right? Yeah. So that's just a no, classic no- example. No data exfiltration whatsoever. Please provide a clear POC. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. Okay. Right. So w- where's where's the where's the where's the line between right. those two? Because dumping all of the records mm-hmm. versus like creating enough information to demonstrate that you've actually found something. That line, there's no real established standard on where mm-hmm. to draw that line, which is part yeah. of where it becomes a case by case thing. And yeah. I think on the flip side of that, you see, you know, a common a common clause is please don't use um, automated tools. Um, it's like what, like a, like a computer? Like that's kind of the whole point. Uh, so what are, what exactly are we talking about here? Like what what that what that clause is actually saying is don't do aggressive scanning where you've not inserted yeah. your own creativity because right? mm-hmm. we've a we've already done that and b we don't want the traffic right. Oh right, or uh, and we don't want that traffic multiplied by all of you. That's well, exactly. Right. I think, I, I think but, it, but, it, but it's such a, it's such an ambiguously phrased term yes. that you end up in a position where you've got folks that are ESL, you've got folks that definitely don't mm-hmm. necessarily have a legal background, right. trying to read through and interpret yeah. all this stuff to work out what's okay and what's not. And it's you know it's an imperfect. I, I like that there's a lot of work going into 
you know, standardizing this stuff, like better preparing the companies on, you know, on, on Katie's side was with Luda or all that, um, you know, on our side, sitting in the middle to be a translation mm -hmm. layer and, and yeah. effectively a broker between these two groups of people that really need to talk, but don't really have a great history of being able to do that. Um, so it's all heading in the right direction, but there's still a long way to go, I think. Yeah, For me, I think the, scoping, the, scoping is the most critical thing we're probably talking about in the entire process, is making sure people understand what is okay. And what, you know, my, my, my if this is the top, everything I do is, is that when I'm doing scoping, is my goal in the whole process is my top of my scope is do no harm, cause no, you know, <laughs> cause no harm. Everything else can be accidental. You know, it's it's don't cause the business to lose money as a result of my activity. Um, do no harm. You know, try not to let. You know, if I see data is one thing, but if I leak data is another thing. Is is my goal is to not to cause any harm to the business. So everything else, you know, is is kind of by by kind of product of what we're doing. Um, one of the things I'm kind of also going in this topic is. Is around one of the things you get into. You know, you're talking about automated tools and talking about you know the the ethics side of things. I really kind of kind of understand about. Um, and one of the things is a lot of cross border. You get like a lot of people in India doing this as well. And one thing I, I think I loved last year listening to the talk around uh, when we're talking about scoping was around the guys who did the courthouse uh, and that yeah. end up getting arrested and so forth. Um, Although that was in scope, though that was totally in scope. You know? <laughs> as, a, as an example of like, even despite it being in scope, but then still all of that happening, that was a really good example for that. I think. <laughs> well, I mean, good. honestly, that's a good example of why I don't think scoping is the most important yeah. thing in this process mm -hmm. at all, because it's it's having the organizational maturity to mm -hmm. one get behind doing something good with vulnerability reports. Two, I mean, in that particular case, that was just infighting politically happening right. where where one you know branch said they had they had legal authority and another you know branch of, of law enforcement said no you don't mm -hmm. and that and it was their infighting that caused those arrests to happen and everything so for Doing me you know <laughs> yeah we we do a vulnerability maturity um, assessment of organizations um, and it's five different capability areas mm -hmm. and only one of them is engineering right because it's this yeah. whole picture internally. Um, I've seen organizations try and just skip to the scoping step. They're like, okay, mm -hmm. first thing we need to do, and this is my big problem that I have with the existing guidance that came out of uh, DHS CISA for the binding operational directive. Mm -hmm. I love that they have this as a major initiative for the U.S. government saying thou shalt have some way to get in touch with mm -hmm. you to report a vulnerability. I love that. What I hated mm -hmm. was they said, step one, decide what's in scope. And I'm like, no, step one yeah, yeah, is decide yeah. What, how how are you fixing vulnerabilities that you already know about? What is your oh, wait, capacity? Can I, can I jump in there? Because capacity, I you know? think the number one thing is to figure out how you want to actually receive that information. To me, that was the thing, right? As, mm -hmm. as a security researcher, you know, sometimes they're coming in through the window or through the other way because they have no other way to get your attention. They don't know how to actually approach you and how to get you that information. Yeah. So to me, the most important thing is how do I, as a security researcher, provide this information to you so that you can then act on it? I can, so, I mean, I'm and, happy and, to and honestly, be wrong. As a security like, researcher, sure, that would be the most important thing. But in terms of what security researchers actually want, which is responsiveness, mm -hmm. yes. um, adequate responsiveness, you know, com uh, competent understanding of what they're we're trying well, to do yes. and action, right? <laughs> yeah. So all that stuff that a researcher actually wants after they find, you know, the point of contact, that's that is the that is the digestive system. So here's the thing. Yes. Yeah. Nobody actually gets from, you know, I don't I don't I don't receive any vulnerable reports from the outside to a functional vuln disclosure program without doing some of those steps. If mm -hmm. they do, you know, it is a trial by fire, completely unnecessary, painful you know, moment where they have to basically struggle with, they basically put out a menu for a restaurant that they've got no kitchen staff for. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. they can do it. They can pull off the shifts. They could maybe feed some people, you know, they can maybe get this done, but it's excessively painful. And there's no mm -hmm. reason for it because we literally have two ISO standards, two ISO standards that mm -hmm. have been out since 2014 and numerous other examples, you know, and, and ways to get ready. And one thing I love about Casey's approach, you know, with his company is that I don't get a lot of, um, let's just say bug bounty refugees from bug crowd, if that makes mm -hmm. sense, you know, <laughs> folks who just got in over their heads and were hurting and everything. Mm -hmm. So I feel like yeah. Casey's team does a good job of making sure 
that, you know, there's no bug bounty Botox going on mm. over there. And that's yeah. something that's really yeah. important. You can put up a front door, but if nobody's listening, I mean, it's like a, it's, you know, yeah. it's a Hollywood ghost town set, you know, and it's, I do, I do, I do appreciate no that, Katie. And it, <laughs> it, it has, it has been, it has been a focus for us, you know, bug crowd actually started out like the way that I characterized mm. why I started the company in the first place looks more like a crowdsourcing problem than it does like a disclosure problem. And I think part of the challenge around where we're up to now um, is that a lot of those things are conflated together. It's all a bug bounty or it's all a VDP or a VDP is all about, you know, engaging people to do work. It's, it's not because you're not paying them. So by definition, it's not actually work you're doing. You're actually putting out, you know, basically a policy and a way to listen from the internet when it's got something to tell you. That's what a VDP is. Um, but there's all of this kind of term confusion around the different ways of, you know, coming back to the founding of Bug Crowd, get access to this pool of people that want to help out in a, a variety of different ways. I think like what we what we focused on because we observed this very quickly. It's like okay, yeah, you know, people that build software that deploy enterprise networks, they're generally way more vulnerable than they think they are. Uh, mm-hmm. And and when you get the the people with the right kind of talent into the mix and and activate them you tend to figure that out. Yeah. So, okay, if too much of that happens too quickly for the organization, they're going to become overwhelmed. Um, they're not going to be in a position to, you know, step back and think about like, what kind of frameworks do we need to change? Like, do we need to implement a proper SDLC? Like what's our, you know, our risk management, our, our approach to like vulnerability risk management um, with, with within the organizational risk-based vulnerability management, for example. Yeah. If they haven't had the opportunity to do that because they're so busy swatting bugs, then we're not really like we've given them information that's valuable, but it could be way more helpful than that. So that's that's been a big part of why we've we've kind of always tried to take that like crawl, walk, run approach. The other is to make sure the researcher gets looked after. Because if yeah. a bunch of people get a commitment made to them and all of a sudden the essence of what's happening on the other side changes because they've gotten overwhelmed. That's that's a bum steer for the research community. It becomes huge overhead for us to be able to keep everyone's expectations in line. And it's just a bad time. So like that's that's context behind that. I will say with VDP as well, you know, this whole distinction between like scope versus not scope, I do put the root cause of that as term confusion around what these things are. Okay. Like a, a VDP is different from a crowdsource security assessment or, you know, what we call next gen pen tests, like crowdsource pen testing, mm-hmm. those sorts of things. Like the, the latter crowdsourcing is against targets. So it's effectively a different way of engaging or encouraging information. Mm-hmm. Um, and you scope that for a VDP, it's against you as an entity. So you're basically saying, I want to know about all of it. Like this is, this is me wanting to hear reactively what, the internet's discovering about my risk posture so that I can do something about that. And scope, it, it kind of better reflects, I think, the fact that, you know, attackers don't read scope um, in they the don't. first place, right? No, I, yeah, so I, this, I, this, no, this whole idea of like, <laughs> yeah. So so I've got, I've got, I mean, for, for me, Casey, one thing is I don't see it as, as a crowdsourcing. I see it as a skill sourcing because I think it's yeah. more about the skills because one, you know, it's not about the volume of people. I think it's about I'm, getting the right. That's people. that's 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 difficult too. Crowdsourcing trigger, <laughs> triggers particular, you know, things yeah, in people's minds. Yeah. So yeah, for me, it's uh, skill sourcing because you know we we can't be the experts in everything. You know, a developer who's writing code is not the expert in security. They're the expert in being able to build a module that will actually serve the, the purpose of the business, and going and getting the right skills. So it kind of gets me to kind of moving on from from two questions of God is is one is you know how how you know the world is very much cloud. And a lot of organizations, it's shared services, it's shared resources, it's infrastructure services. There, you know, I remember working a lot of companies where um, I did penetration testing in maritime. And mm-hmm. one of the things I did is going into a ship and into a power station. The problem I had was that the company, they, they own the engine, but they don't own the data. <laughs> the, the you, you you have a car today. You're buying a car contract. You own yeah. the, the freaking cars. The, the, cars are where you see this play out. Today. Yeah, yeah. You, you see you own the car, but the data in the car is not owned by you. You're actually there to provide that to the manufacturer. Same as TVs. Everything we're moving to this multiple contract uh, type of scenario. And cloud is definitely one of those areas. I remember, you know, you, you're not, you know, the company might be hosting it in whatever hosting name cloud whatever it might be. And now, yeah. you know, how do you do that, especially with shared resources, to do those yeah. proper testing? And the second part, I, I, 
Yeah, if it sorry, is, well, so is that yeah, a two, two part question? I'll, I'll let you answer the first one and then I'll move to the second one after. Yeah, probably. <laughs> okay. Okay. yeah so, so I think honestly, cloud is almost easier. If you're talking mm -hmm. about, this is, you know, one of the things that's that's a big feature in the ISO standards, uh, Katie mentioned before, and it's it's been, you know, this kind of tough nut to crack behind the scenes mm -hmm. with a lot of what the the platforms have done since we we came on the scene mm -hmm. is this idea of like multi multi vendor coordination uh, or multi party coordination yeah. of, of of response. You know, a, a, a car is effectively most of the time a collection of OEMs that's been mm -hmm. in, assembled into a unit and then and then sold to a customer. And then you've got the data, and then you've got all the other things that you were just talking mm -hmm. about there. Um, you know, at the average piece of home networking kit um, often has a lot of a lot of aspects like that, like supply chains that make mm -hmm. up physical things that we interact with mm -hmm. that have a cyber component to them that they've been there the whole time. So, yeah. so trying to figure out how to coordinate vulnerability disclosure, uh, like down that supply chain, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, we're recording this um, at a point in time in 2020 where supply really? chain is now very much top of mind. So I'm not, mm -hmm. I swear I'm not doing the buzzword thing right now, but it's true. <laughs> like that's just sort of how it works. Like with cloud, it's a little easier because it tends to be a dynamic target that you're assessing and it's in one place and it's either there or it's not. So who's hosting it and what all's behind it? It's not to say that that doesn't, um, that still factors in heavily. So don't hear why I'm not saying there, but I do think it tends to be more obvious in terms of who owns what. Um, and honestly, you know, going back to the combo around VDP and scope and all of that stuff before, like the sale of Expanse this year, and, and the rise of like attack surface management as a as a as a category, um, it's evidence of something that we've known in security for a really long time. Like people don't know where this stuff is, uh, and 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 ultimately, that, that's really what it comes down to. This is not a surprise for anyone who's been in the space because it's always been a difficult <laughs> thing to solve. But then cloud's gone and made that happen at the speed of yeah. caffeine and internet. Mm -hmm. um, you go throw Docker and whatever else on top of that, and you've now suddenly got everything everywhere. Um, that potentially comes back to me as an entity because I am the owner of it, um, but I don't really know where it is. So when it comes to defining scope and who's responsible for what, that's actually you know, usually a fair bit of work. You got me laughing here. As part of the, the disclosure program, should we tell me where my data really is? Because so, <laughs> I don't know where it is. It's that happens. <laughs> that, like, that's, that, I mean, like S, S3, like all of these breaches you hear about with, with databases being less, left in, you know, cloud provider, cloud storage buckets. That's essentially that. It's like, where is yeah. my data? I forgot. Like someone put it there probably well-intentioned and this is part of a thing that they were being asked to do for work. Um, but they didn't consider the security implications mm -hmm. of that, nor did they integrate that particular like thing that they bought on a credit card into the ISMS of that organization such that it could be managed going forward. So, you know, it, this I could see that problem actually getting more difficult over time because... You know, 2020 is like the great zero trust experiment, and we're all yeah. cloud cloud native now. I'm not a big um, fan so. of zero trust. That's my. I think it's a uh, it's it's the balance. I, I I'm for building trust. Yes, uh, zero trust is, is is not effective for the business. It's always finding that balance. So, Katie, I have so, a question for you. I, I oh, you, yeah, but I was going to jump in on uh, the on sure. this uh, supply chain okay. vulnerability yeah. coordination stuff. So. I started Microsoft Vulnerability Research in 2008, and part of that was to do research on third-party software, you know, um, that that affected Microsoft customers. Mm -hmm. And a major driver of that was doing multi-party and supply chain vulnerability coordination because mm -hmm. um, it, it's essentially a a vital cousin of the first-party vulnerability coordination, and it needed dedicated attention. And this mm -hmm. was. You know, this is at Microsoft, obviously, you know, major operating system company, the biggest software company in the world. Um, but the concept of organizations having that capability in-house is literally mm -hmm. a dozen years old. So I want people to kind of gain some perspective of, you know, when they're thinking yep, about, oh, we have to, mm -hmm. we have to, you know, be able to handle all this stuff. It's like, we're still dealing with most of the internet, not adequately handling First party vulnerability disclosure, one bug, one vendor, you know, um, and and settling on that. So I don't want to underestimate, you know, the importance of thinking those things through. And that that is literally what, you know, what we help companies do is help understand um, not just the tactical of where are my assets, where are my bugs, but it's how do we even deal with a situation where we've got a complex supply chain, you know, 
up and down. We are somewhere in the middle of it, you know, because usually organizations mm-hmm. are, they, they have, um, they have dependencies, you know, up and downstream in the supply chain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, and I then, mean, the first, re- I'm yeah. so, just to jump in there, the mm-hmm. first real disclosure that we got through Bug Crowd was actually against not a first party thing. It was a uh, SaaS that we use for authentication. Um, and I was like, oh, great. Now, how do I communicate this? to them and we locked out because they also happen to be a bug crowd customer. So mm-hmm. made it super easy to sort of get that, get the um, the security researcher connected to the right people over at the other company. And it went fairly well, but I do think that's going to be the big challenge moving forward. As I get more of those, how do I make sure that I can effectively get the right people communicating to the right people without being an inefficient middleman? Right. And yeah. well, and that's, that's exciting that you were able to do that, you know, with, with, uh, Casey's company's help with Bug Crowd's help. I have definitely seen uh, not Bug Crowd um, <laughs> failing miserably at that one to the point where I'm not kidding you. I have been embedded at a shared customer with a different bug bounty mm-hmm. platform provider and two groups at the same company, they couldn't coordinate bugs and they were both using that, the other folks. Mm-hmm. And and so that, that just kind of goes to show that I think that this skill set in general and even the concept of what's in scope for them to help you with right. is still developing. And um, I like that, you know, we've got folks who have who have lived, you know, lived the consultants and pen testers life, you know, before in, ha- in, in Casey um, of being a real hacker who started that that company, um, you know, with Bug Crowd. And I just feel like there's you know, there, there's, there's a lot of your mileage may vary in terms of getting yes. the right help for this, this type of yeah. thing. And I, I, that's the, the, it's very kind of you to say that, Katie. I, and I completely agree. Like it's, it's, your mileage may vary in terms of one size fits all, like the different approaches that the third parties have taken. Um, but also that, um, you know, every company is a snowflake, like every system is a snowflake, every vulnerability is a snowflake. Mm -hmm. So you've got so many snowflakes at this point that it really becomes more around like the underlying approach that the organization Mm -hmm. has to this, as opposed to like, what is the security thing that we're going to bolt on top of our existing security program? To me, that's the true value of this. It's it's not... Mm -hmm you know, a better pen test or a Vuln scan or a particular mm-hmm. thing. It's it's really this idea of like integrating build or break a feedback loop, f- feedback loops into your organization in a way that, you know, becomes a part of design, becomes a part mm-hmm. of how you structure your organization itself. Like how do you, you how do you negotiate a third party supply chain contract to accommodate the fact that mm-hmm. that upstream provider is a part of your problem when it comes to risk? as it relates to your customer. Like if you haven't seen this stuff as an organization, you're less inclined to even have that thought in the, in the first place. So I think that's where the true value of this starts to come out. This idea of, you know, builders and breakers not thinking the same, but if you can get them talking to each other and have them basically exchanging, you know, Vulcan mind melding as best they can, um, then good things come out of that. Absolutely. So this leads me into my next question. When are we going to see fixed crowd? Um, oh, yeah. No, I mean, well, my company does a lot of that stuff where we, you know, we help with internal staff augmentation mm-hmm. um, because, yeah, the, the the growing volume, it's not just the volume of bugs, but it's the, it's the skill sets required yeah. to understand them, to guide the existing developers into a better understanding, mm-hmm. to point them towards secure development lifecycle practices that will yeah. reduce the overall number and severity mm-hmm. of vulnerabilities over time, and ideally increase the complexity. You want the low-hanging fruit eliminated by you, right? So <laughs> that's that's what you want. You don't want yeah. it hanging out there for you know bug bunny Botox but cowboys out there. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, it's it's making sure that there's that there's that's that kind of efficiency. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we've you know we've been doing that that kind of work. We did that kind of work with Zoom, you know, and mm-hmm. we got them. We flattened their bug curve because they got a mm-hmm. big spike of bugs because they got really popular and we yeah. helped flatten their curve by like 37% in 10 weeks, which was, mm-hmm. trust me, if you knew the raw numbers, that was significant. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was, it, it, it is really about, um, making sure that, that the organization inside, if mm-hmm. they don't have the right people, yeah. the right tools, the right skills that we've got to prop them up. So, okay. um, yeah. I wouldn't say fix bounty per se, because that makes it too transactional. Mm-hmm. Like internally, you know, you have to have organizational memory that carries 
um, why you made a certain security decision, you know, mm-hmm. why you punted, you know, something. And that's knowledge of your product life cycle, your, mm-hmm. your, um, you know, your support life cycle. How long are you going to even keep that product mm-hmm. under support, yeah. right? You may make a different prioritization yeah. decision. So it's yeah. about getting embedded and understanding all of these, you know, internal company needs yeah. and and our company helps a lot with that so yeah, yeah. thanks for asking we didn't even talk about this we were in that's great what what, what what katie's talking about there as well are, are the things that you know if you if you're working on those that they're you're addressing the problem closest to the root cause at that mm-hmm. point and you and you're in a position where you know the cost of having to catch things later on down down the the kind of timeline um mm-hmm is less expensive because you're getting it done sooner. So I, okay. I, I completely agree with that where, you know, what we've done and what we've seen, um, there are the transactional fixes that, 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 that are possible okay. in terms of like mitigating specific risks. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's areas of that that Buckrat's already played with and that we work with, yeah. with customers on. Um, I think in general in the middle, and this is sort of almost the bridge between the part that Katie's talking about in terms of the institutional knowledge and reset mm-hmm. and the part that, that, you know, crowdsourcing addresses and the crowd addresses, which is more where I play, um, you know, where can, where can trends be identified? Like are there particular, are there particular frameworks or particular types of software that as an organization, you're more systemically having issues right. with um, that indicate an underlying any pattern? That might be addressed by developer training, um, mm-hmm. or eliminating or, or a shift in framework, from your life, or, like or getting rid of means. PHP, or like <laughs> right. yeeting, yeeting it into the sun. So, like, yes. there's all these sorts of things where, um, and it's almost like this, like the the way that we've just kind of framed that. It's it's like we didn't talk about this mm-hmm. ahead of time, but yeah, you know, there, there's the there's the discrete issue that gets found by you know an individual all the way down to the root cause, like Mm -hmm. organizational cultural decision that probably happened 10 years ago that led to that. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're really talking about addressing different parts of that chain because it is ultimately a spectrum. Those things are all tied together. If you just work on one piece, then you'll not be able to miss, not be able to work on the other. And that's where I think being able to, you know, approach that mindfully and not just Mm -hmm. do one part of it and say job done is really important. Um, but that, those are some of the ways I see those things tying together. Yeah, I, I really think it's important that we reward the right kind of the right process. The kind of re- by yeah. rewarding. I remember a long time ago doing a, a security awareness training, and we, we end up having this um, incident response plan, and we rewarded employees with money when they reported incidents. And the reward and the motivation was to get money, so they reported everything. Um, and that's what, you know, we realized then is that that wasn't the right motivation. It wasn't the right kind of thing. We weren't, that's not what we were trying to achieve. Right. That's the classic Dilbert cartoon, right? right. From 1995, yeah. where they're Co- saying. Co- um, Cobra farming. Yeah, yes. you know, exactly. Cobra farming. So, so there's something, there's something mm-hmm. important though, um, about reversing the polarity, you know, of what you're paying mm-hmm. for, right. Of paying for fixes yes. transactionally and stuff. So there's a, there's a good story here. Um, the European Commission authorized a bug bounty program for all open source software that's commonly used in the European government. So this this mm-hmm. kicked off a few years ago, and uh, you know there was there's this idea that you know if you just find the bugs and throw them over the fence that that's that's just unequivocally a good thing. Job done. Well, open yeah. source okay. is different, right? <laughs> open source is different. There are maintainers that are mm-hmm. sole maintainers or they're part time on an open source project that might be quite popular. We saw this with OpenSSL, mm-hmm. right? Before it got mm-hmm. the resuscitation, you know, investments from it the Linux it. Foundation. So here is the thing. I asked the Apache Server Core developers, um, hey, mm-hmm. you know, uh, if we were to structure this bounty in such a way that would be most helpful to you, would it be helpful? <laughs> to ask for a solution, you know, because you're open source. Um, And would that be helpful? And they said, absolutely not. Please don't offer money for that. And I was very confused. And I was like, wouldn't this be helpful? And they said, yeah, most of our our work right now is dealing with, in terms of accepting Mm -hmm. or not accepting security fixes, is arguing with people about breaking changes, you know, and we're the core maintainers for a reason. So basically they saw this as like a danger of not only overwhelming them with more people wanting to get their co- their code committed, you know, and everything, and that would increase yep. their workload in a bad way without increasing security, right? But mm-hmm. the other thing was open source relies on volunteer maintainers. And if suddenly the people who are p- 
fixing issues for free are now, you know, going to be moved into this transactional model, it made less room for them to really identify the folks that would become the next generation of maintainers. And to give you one scary fact, OpenBSD is is, uh, the average core maintainer age is 55 years old. So just like draw that into yourself for a minute. That's the average (laughs) age. So we need new blood doing the core maintenance of some of these packages and doing these sort of transactional incentives turns out is not going to work in terms of giving them better fixes and a better pipeline for who's going to take over these projects. So I just wanted to put that out there that it's not like a one-to-one pay for the bugs, pay for the fixes. Mm-hmm. That's going to solve our problems here. Right. Actually, it's very reminiscent of, I remember the first job, I my first software engineering job where the idea was, oh, we're going to, we're going to give bonuses to the QA team for finding bugs. And it's like, but as the engineer, like, okay, cool. So I'll just, I'll just collude with them. I'll put some right. bugs in and we'll split yeah. the bonuses 50, 50. Like this is yeah. just not a, like it's unintended consequences. I understand what you're trying to do, but by offering money for the stuff, you're going to create some perverse incentives and potentially disrupt things that were working just yeah. fine. Well, it's it's un, 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 better. <laughs> So. Yeah, unintentional economic forces that you introduce to things. Yeah, like, yeah. This yeah. whole idea, and, and it comes back to the whole crawl, walk, run piece mm-hmm. we we're talking about before. You know, starting this off in a smaller context and actually getting that feedback, but then mm-hmm. as an organization, making sure that you're actually taking that on board beyond just fixing the bug, so to speak, yeah. and and thinking through. Okay, if we were to scale this out, like how would we do? Um, you know, ingestion of like offered code changes at scale. Mm-hmm. Like if, if you know, we had people offering this web, web application firewall rules for us to integrate uh, in front of a, a mm-hmm. dynamic platform, for example, how would we validate those? Um, you can't just go and take someone else's code and slap it on top of your, yeah. your organization. That's, that's unwise. So like all of these different things, and there's a million of those, and they're different for every single organization. So this whole idea of saying, okay, how much of that are you going to do based on your baseline? Um, and then how do you think about this as it scales out? Like what are the next steps that you need to take to make sure that, that you know, all of those um, kind of foundational elements have been put in place? And then that ultimately ends up, you know, the closer it can be to like balance of forces from an economic and, and an incentive standpoint, mm-hmm. you know, ultimately when you see like bug bounty programs that are actually kind of awesome, um, they're at the end of a lot of that. So, so it's, 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 you know, this balancing of forces and, and, and setting these different things up in the organization that's progressed and scaled up over time to the point where it's at a maturity level where you can just plug it into the internet and it works. Um, that doesn't happen by mistake. So I think that's, that's kind of the key thing. Um, Oh, awesome. by the way, that Scott Adams uh, Dilbert with the perverse incentives <laughs> that got uh, anonymously plastered on my office door at Microsoft right after I announced those bounty programs. So just so you know, code me a minivan. Really yeah, I'm going to code I, me a minivan. Was right on the I door, it, and I, I left it. I had there. it as a Twitter header for a while. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, good. no, I just left it there. I was like. Yeah. Okay. We'll see how this goes. And, you know, it turns out it was, it, it went great because last year, I think they, they spent $14 million on bug bounties yeah. last year. Mm-hmm. Microsoft yeah. did. So from and I 2013 that, to now. Yeah. yeah. You know, on, on that, on that, on that piece, because like, this is a question I get asked, Katie, you probably see it all the time as well. It's like, how do you avoid that? How do you avoid, you know, Cobra farming is, is the, um, is the economic reference for it going back to some, some stuff that, you know, people can look up if they're interested. Um, how do I avoid that? And you know the 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 reality of it, yeah, there there is the risk of of perverse incentive and and things kind of looping back around like that. Um, anecdotally, uh, we've not seen any of that so far, and I think it's you know largely going back to some of the stuff we talked about earlier oh, about people though. being good. But then, Absolutely. okay, I'm sure, I'm sure it is a thing that has happened. So this is, I'm not saying that it's impossible and it's non-existent. But like the reality is that getting caught doing that is actually pretty easy too. So so as a, you know, as someone who sits within an organization who potentially wants to code themselves a minivan, you're also aware of like get blame and, mm-hmm. and all of the different ways that you could end up going to jail for doing that, um, which well, becomes and, a fairly strange return. Yeah, and now it's not even where there's uh, that sort of insider collusion part that's the only yeah. potential collusion that can happen or cheating of the system, the intent of the system, really. Um, we've, seen, we've seen triage people who are under contract steal yeah. 
Voln reports from, you know, what they're triaging, the bug, bug bounty program or Voln disclosure program they're triaging, and then copy and paste that exact same bug report to another vendor who is vulnerable to the same thing and collect the reward. And that's essentially them abusing their triage visibility yeah. into mm-hmm. incoming bugs. And this, I yeah. think, is, you know, a problem you know, this is a huge problem. And this is literally just, you know, of the past few years where there've been bug bounty uh, platforms where, yeah. you know, you, you, you guys have the same hiring, you know, constraints that everybody else does and mm-hmm. trying to scale, you know, um, appropriately. So you're going to bring on contractors for a period and, you know, before they're full timers and whatnot. So we've actually seen this manifesting um, as, as another threat in this ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. That's it's actually the risk of that or the potential for that is is another one of those things that we kind of saw coming over the hill. So in terms of you know how how Bug Crowd resources the the, the triage team, it's primarily in house. If they're contractors, it's usually because they're full time contractors in a part of the world where we haven't, um, you know, we're not necessarily headquartered yet, um, and you know, really like firm and and very strict rules on on what's okay and what's not okay to to maintain that chinese wall in in effect mm-hmm. with within the organization it's like all right if you're able to see these sorts of things here are all the other things that you're not allowed to do um on condition you know on pain of you basically retaining your employment um and it's one of those things it's it's a it, you know it feels draconian because it's a lot of like Oh, we're doing hacker stuff and it's heaps of fun and all of that. And here's like some really like hardcore rules that you also have to follow. But it's important because ultimately, like this whole this whole dynamic relies on trust and it relies on expectations being aligned and kept um, as the process plays out. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, it was called it was Popular Science Magazine in 2008 called Microsoft Security Grunt, which was kind of a conglomeration of job descriptions. But it's, it, they, the way they described it was the people who have to answer your email when you email Microsoft about a security issue and deal with that. So this was yeah. kind of a broad painting picture, but they literally, Popular Science named it as one of the top 10 worst jobs in science. And it was literally between elephant vasectomist and whale feces researcher. So you got to like take that in, you know. You're seeing and, a trend there. Yeah, you know, and everything. And uh, by the way, I got to say that on an official IST advisory board call just last month. And I was so That's pleased. Awesome. That I'm, I'm certain I'm the first person to go on federal record. And you, should saying, have, you should have put the salaries. <laughs> elephant, yeah, exactly. Elephant vasectomist and whale feces researcher. But here's the, the thing. guy that's really well done. Elephant guy, not so much. But Yeah, no, that triage job sucks. And, and you know, it does suck. And mm-hmm. when you're good at it, you're going to be good at it and you're not going to want to do it for the rest of your life. So the fact of the matter mm-hmm. is that is, yeah. that's a very important piece of understanding this yeah, ecosystem team management where, that. yeah. And where bug hunters may be happy to hunt bugs for many years longer than that. It's those folks that begin to be the, you know, the shock absorbers on the inside mm-hmm. that you start to see a degeneration and shorter and shorter times where they're yeah. willing to even do that work. So you're kind of in a mm-hmm. little puppy mill of having to recruit train and make sure that they're very efficient yeah yeah and then and then create and creating a career pathway and doing all those sorts of things like i was just gonna the, say i think that's the that's the best part of that is that that that's that the there upside is a, right the upside is that there is this entry level into security where right you can you can get this job you can start understanding the problems you don't and you can start to see a career path that develops from there and i think that that's the upside is that this is one of the few you know people ask me all the time how do you get into cybersecurity and like you know, cyber exists. We we provide training and, and career development. And, yeah. But saying I want to get into cybersecurity is like saying I want to be a doctor or a lawyer. Like there's so many jobs. Um, and so, but one of the and there's not that many entry level. And I think that's a really good, solid like entry level. Get a good taste for what things are like. Um, yeah. Get a, a solid understanding and foundation. Yeah, a lot of people came from support industry because you know that's ultimately they're listening to all the problems every single day, and and they're there trying think, to fix them. As yeah, well. and for yeah. and for us, I mean, there's no difference. Yeah. I mean, it's partially because yeah. you know I have um, the type of organization that we run. We're a very small, small engineering team. Mm-hmm. Um, VP of engineering and CISO, right? So like. There's not as much like back and forth between the security team and the engineering team. We're all one team. And QA, yeah, QA. But, is right, QA is part good. of my right. And but the the idea that a vulnerability or security problem is just another bug. 
that's how they're treated. We we look at it like any other bug. What's the secu- what's the risk? What's the business value? What happens if we don't fix it? And so it goes through the same sort of product triaging. And we have that benefit. I think a lot of companies, and I'm curious, you know, Kitty, you probably see this, like where it's way further apart. And it's like you have the security team, you have whoever's deciding what's going to get done, and the guys doing it and the, and the people doing it um, just are so far apart that it's almost impossible to get these things that are security mm-hmm. problems fixed. I'm yeah. curious what no, your experience is. is. Yeah. It, it is absolutely like that in a lot of organizations. And especially because time to market with whatever it is that you're mm-hmm. building is so essential that, mm-hmm. that, you know, we all know this as, as entrepreneurs and everything that you have to build the thing and, and focus on building the thing. And so security and those security teams are often hired after the fact. So there's a well-established development culture that Mm -hmm. exists. And then the security team comes in and often they're seen as the, the, the no people, you know, just captain no over there telling us we can't do this thing that before the security team got here, we were, we were free. Right. Right. So there's often just this like family counseling that we end up having to do to be quite honest, where we're like, okay, Now we're going to get together and we're going to count your bugs. Okay. Everybody got the same count. (laughs) All right. Now we're going to. These are the features that you didn't intend to put in the product. (laughs) Exactly. And you know, I mean, literally getting into organizations where they want to like fight Jira math wars saying that shouldn't count as a security bug because it was this other thing. And it's like, you know, well, this one should count as a a separate bug than this other one, even though they're the same root cause because they're on different endpoints. You get into these religious wars Mm-hmm. Between literally labeling in your bug databases. Oh yeah, I mean, how many are labeled yeah. by by design? <laughs> I mean, the same the same is true. Like when you talk about features and bugs and so on and so forth. Like mm-hmm. I've run into that sometimes as well. It's like, look, all I really care about is how much new work are we doing and how much rework are we doing, and yeah. I don't really care what's causing the rework until the the amount of rework that we're doing is so it's so large yeah. that we're not getting actual, you know, new stuff done. Then it's like, well, is it because product isn't defining the requirements well enough? Is it because the engineers are trying to get too much done too quickly and they're putting all these bugs in, you know, yeah. unintentionally? I, I think so like, so on, like, with with that, because in, in, in my mind, um, you know, based on observation, there's almost this, you know, post Facebook and pre Facebook kind of line in the sand in terms of, um, you know, an organization's natural tendency to be, be able to even understand what we're talking about right now. Like mm-hmm. organ, organizations that are older, this whole idea of, oh, well, how are you going to fit it in? Like the conversation we're having is more natively compatible with folks that are agile first, cloud first, CICD, all of those sorts of things, or at least who think about that as a business because you have to do that too. Um, when you're retrofitting this stuff over, you know, an organization that's been around from a technology standpoint for 30 or 40 years or more, <laughs> Um, right. It's 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 a lot of work because you know the whole idea of oh well how are we going to prioritize how are we pushing the pipeline forward to insert this work that's coming off you know off the off the wire um, they don't have a muscle group that does that yet necessarily right. so yeah. I, I think know, a lot it, of organizations get pushed into it because they're they have an existential threat to their business bottom line that's yeah, what pushed Microsoft 100%. into trustworthy computing initiative where they did a code freeze and said every developer is getting trained now on writing yep. more secure code. And then they yep. started their secure development life cycle. Same thing. Zoom went for a 90 day feature freeze, except for security features, because, you know, they were experiencing that, that existential threat that they couldn't, they could not mm-hmm. go on with business as usual yep. without addressing it in a very serious way. We hope yep. that most organizations don't have to have that sort of shock to their system to get them to start investing yep. But I definitely yeah. have seen a pattern where, um, to your point, Casey, it's interesting where the companies that seem to understand that they are in over their heads are these mm. older companies that are coming yeah. forward and saying, like, Psst, oh. don't tell anyone we're over 100 years old, you know, and right. we only got into computers like <laughs> know, five years I ago, know. right? <laughs> yeah. And yeah, we're like, it's very obvious. Don't, right. you, don't, you don't need to be shy about that. Right. So, you know, I think it's these companies that are, you know, that already have huge mm. sprawling infrastructures that need mm. kind of the most like TLC in how yeah. to yes. get to a place 100%. where they can be responsive, right? And that this yeah. is a new, this is a new work item engine for them, right? Yeah. Um, that yeah. they need and to get that rhythm right. What? Like in ingestion, I mean, even even the idea of being able to admit um, 
admit the fact that there's likely to be a problem in the first place. Like to me, that's becoming tantamount to security maturity. The idea that like, no, like I know that somewhere um, at some time over the past, you know, existence I've had on the internet, one of my developers has made some sort of mistake that's created a security risk. That's just mathematically probably true. Um, And the companies that are comfortable with that are the ones that end up being in a really strong position to be able to integrate this feedback and just Mm -hmm. have it be a part of how they operate. Um, but also I think they ultimately end up being the ones that are more trusted by the consumer base as well. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over time. Cause that's, that's something that I see the older organizations struggling with just because of, you know, 40 years of history of saying there's yeah. nothing wrong. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So in companies that have waterfall approaches, still two, three year life cycles and year freeze codes, <laughs> codes um, are probably going to struggle they were probably going to take a long time to, to I mean, yeah, in some ways, but in other ways, you know, there are certain things about those companies that it makes them a lot more deliberate about things, which if you're, if you are talking about needing to hire resources and plan for them internally, mm-hmm. those old fashioned waterfall companies, you know, that's, that's yeah. kind of their bread and butter of how they plan, you know, plan yeah. releases and plan engagement. Um, but I do think that, you know, the companies that are smaller, more agile, more compact, um, they can get things done faster. The real danger there is those companies are usually moving so fast. And remember, the turnover rate in our industry is is high, and especially for jobs that touch this area, right? Whale feces, elephant vasectomies, you know, that kind of thing, right? So where where we see smaller companies falling down is in failing to capture some of that magic that simply was living in the heads of these, you know, um, in place persons at a given point in time. So what we do see is we'll see a very responsive organization and then key personnel leave, take the institutional knowledge of how to make that a very good responsive Mm -hmm. organization. And the org itself suffers the wound of having to relearn that yes. operational capacity. So it's not a fixed point in time that we see you're mature and mm-hmm. you're not. It's like this group in your organization is highly mature, but that person's about to leave the company and you're going to be dropped down into the relatively mm-hmm. immature levels of the rest of the company, right? Okay. So we, we see all of these kind of mixed modes going on. So I think we're, we, we might be able to solve the whole world's problems on this call today. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, feel like and, I feel like we've fixed it. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we've fixed it. I think for everyone who's, who's listening to this, we'll, we'll, we'll be very clear and everything's going to be fixed. So, um, And the sun's starting to rise here in Estonia. So I thought... Oh, God. One thing, <laughs> <laughs> so one of, the things, one of the things I'd like, you know, for the two perspectives, for, for the companies who's thinking about this or wants to really address it, I'd like to get, you know, anyone who's going to take this journey, anyone who's listening in, what's your recommendation? And, and the s- second part of it as well, for security researchers who want to do the right thing, what do you recommend for them? So the two-part question, you know, for companies who's thinking about this, what's your kind of recommendation the path they take and where's a good place to start? And for security researchers, the same. Wow. So I, for security researchers, I think just like getting a, getting to be a part of a community, you know, plug in as, as much as you possibly can. It's mm-hmm. not just about learning to hack or, or, or learning how to, you know, do whatever the thing is that you're wanting to do. I actually do think that we grow as a almost, I've got this picture on, um, <clears throat> on the office wall in San Francisco. It's the, uh, mm-hmm. it's a swarm of birds. Um, and I kind of think about, you know, the community in a similar way. Mm-hmm. Like if, if, if we're together, then um, the sum becomes, the whole becomes far greater than some of the parts. So I think, you know, for, for researchers to be able to do that, like <clears throat> we've got, you know, discords, there's forums, you know, bug crowd does a, a virtual, we we're doing virtual conferencing before it was cool. Um, or virtual, you know, security conferences, partly because we wanted to just, you know, create opportunities mm-hmm. for connection and to be able to get, you know, educational information into the hands yeah. of people, you know, to see if it matches with their curiosity and they could move forward. Yeah. I think that happens in community. I'm a huge believer in that. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> for, for organizations, really, I mean, you know, the, the, the biased but, but fairly, um, you know, accurate recommendation is give us a call. Uh, right. just in terms of being able to sit down and understand where you're up to, like what are the things that you're trying to get done? You know, if, you, if you're if coming in saying we, we need to start a public bug bounty program so we can do a huge press release on Friday and it's Wednesday and you've not done anything, we're likely to say, no, don't do that. And then we can have a conversation around how you get your goals met 
um, in a way that's more sane and that kind of fits in with what you're trying to get done as an organization. I think especially for the larger organizations that might have, might be, you know, earlier on in, in this process, um, you know, reaching out to Katie and, and the Luda crew as well. Like the, all of this stuff around like how do you mature yourself as an organization to be in a position where you are, you know, in 2021, um, at or near the top of the pack as it relates to cybersecurity. There's a lot of work and honestly, every organization's in that boat together. So, so to be able to get assistance from, from organizations like hers from a consulting standpoint, I think is, is really valuable as well. So for both, don't go it alone. <laughs> don't go it alone, 100%, yeah. 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 yeah no, totally. thanks, Casey, I appreciate that. You know, we, we teamed up on the UK government. So Luta was yes. in there um, and then, you know, we were helping to get them ready and mature. And this was a government-wide, mm-hmm. um, you know, initiative where they wanted to assess their operational maturity find out what are the people processes and tools we're missing so that we don't get a bad case of bug indigestion when we start opening mm-hmm. the front door. And then, you know, we, and then we uh, coupled up with bug crowd who provided, you know, that initial service of making sure it ran smoothly and that, mm-hmm. you know, hacker expectations were met and, you know, and, you know, they were getting good advice um, on how yeah. to fix some of these issues. So, yeah, I think that it's important to be able to, you know, mm-hmm. do that organizational assessment Think about what your goals are. Definitely, you know, neither Bug Crowd nor Luta Security is into you just getting a press release out of it because yeah. ultimately that's it, it will come back and bite you, whether, you mm-hmm. know, whether that's in the form of, of perverse incentives or, you know, even, mm-hmm. you know, making it more difficult for you to hire internal folks. You know, if you're focusing so much energy on your external bug bounty programs, um, you know, and there's skill sets that you could actually hire for internally, like you haven't gotten to that sophistication mm-hmm. level where, you know, you can't possibly afford the the pairs of eyes that you would need internally, you know, I think that's super important. And then from security researchers standpoint, um, you know, I would advise them, you know, definitely belonging to a community is super important, mm-hmm. but ultimately, you know, how you choose to spend your time, whether it's hobbyist hacking time, professional hacking time, mm-hmm. come to an understanding with yourself about what your goals yeah. are, right? Is Are your goals to learn? Then, you know, definitely you can have a broad, um, you know, availability of targets. If your goal is to make money, though, the thing I advise people to do is say, go for a company that already offers a bug bounty program. You will not believe mm-hmm. how many researchers come to me and say, how can I make such and such company pay a bug bounty to me for this vulnerable disclosure mm-hmm. report? And I'm like, do they have a bug bounty program? And they said, no, how can I make them have one? It's like, <laughs> try not, how about you not spend any of your time trying to make people do something they're not ready for? Instead, just go to the companies that have advertised that they're ready mm-hmm. for it. So think of it, you know, for researchers, yeah. if your goal is to make money, choose your targets wisely, calculate your hourly rate of Mm -hmm. if I get the highest bounty, how many hours is it worth it to me to spend arguing back and forth? Or am I ready to like set it and forget it, you know, and just kind of send it off? If I get paid, great. If not, whatever. But really be ruthless about your, about your time. Mm -hmm. Um, If you are trying to make a living using bug bounty programs as part of that living. So that's that's my advice for researchers. Well said yeah. from both of you. And Mike, any any closing thoughts or anything? Yeah, I mean, would... I think I think one of the um, uh, important parts um, is so I think one of the important parts is also like just understanding the mechanisms that you already have in place and trying to make like for developers. I think one of the things rather than making it adversarial internally and fi- figuring out how to make it so that it's just part of the developer's job, like any other bug fix is one of those areas that gets overlooked a lot and how to leverage. I think if you're a newer company and you're, you're doing like continuous delivery or agile, I'm not a big agile fan, um, but uh, you know, continuous delivery or whatever methodology you're using, how do you plug this into your CI CD? How do you make these programs just sort of work like any other part of the business um, getting feature development or bug fixes in? And I think, um, you approach it from that perspective and things just go a lot smoother. And I think when you're the larger ones, that's where other companies, you, you need uh, external help in, in helping to bridge those gaps. But if you're in moving, in moving to that place, I think yes. that's a really good place to land it because ultimately that's, this is what the future of development and business and being on the internet 
looks like. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's distributed. It's like feature rich. It's been constantly mm-hmm. updated. Um, and, and that's where, you know, everyone's at various straight stages of maturity on that journey. But I, I believe that's like ultimately kind of what the end state looks like for basically everyone. So, right. okay, where are you? Where are you with respect to that? And what steps do you take next moving forward? And I think you have to be honest with yourself about where you are, right? Just, and, you know, yeah. yeah. No, we, we published, a, you know, a free guide uh, called the Vulnerability Coordination Maturity Model. And it's on our website. It's vutasecurity.com slash VCMM. And you can just download the slides. We're not tracking you with cookies. We're not asking for your email address. It's literally as free as free comes on the internet. <laughs> and, you know, we're just making that available for, for free for people to just look at and try to get a sense of where they are maturity wise. Obviously, you know, when we do a maturity assessment, we go much further in depth than what you see on the website there, but it's a really good framework. If people want to self-assess, like, am I ready for even a vuln disclosure program, let alone a bug bounty program, they can literally take a look at those slides and super easy tell themselves, you know, is this realistic or do we have other work where we need to invest further, you know, in our internal processes before we take on this other work stream that is very demanding and, and is a work stream that we don't entirely control. I think that's the big, you know, transition is that you're adding in another work stream that your company mm-hmm. can't, can't necessarily control the rhythm of that work stream. So being prepared, almost like a customer support organization, but Mm -hmm. the customer support that deals with the people that can hack you out of business is really what it is, right? So, so if I were to kind of try and summarize everything up from that, (laughs) the closing statements, you know, going going to Mike, Mike, what you're really telling me is that not to do it as a checkbox and not to do it as a special project is you want to actually build it into your actually existing processes. You want to make it something that is part of your job and is part of basically the entire life cycle process. Not special, not a checkbox, try to get it into the existing workflow. And from Katie, I think is really, you know, setting the goals and really understanding about what your intentions are and making sure you actually, you know, put your time and the resources into the right places. And from Casey, it's really about don't go it alone, get help, be part of a community. I think that really sums it up. And it, for any one of our audience who's really looking to take on this path, I do highly recommend, you know, reach out to Katie. Uh, Katie's one of the world experts in this area, has been doing it for a long time and, and really started it off. I think it was, was it James was the, one of the first bug bounty payments you worked on going out. Mm-hmm. And, and definitely, if you're looking to get part of a community, uh, reach out to Casey because that's really, you know, that's where you can get your network. That's where you can get and run your knowledge off because we all come in, you know, in this, it, you know, we might come in with a specific set of skills, but being part of a community will help you run those skills off and become a much better skilled person. So that's really where I kind of think, you know, coming down to that, you know, don't go to alone, get help, uh, reach out to Katie and Casey. Uh, they definitely be there to help you and direct you in the right uh, uh, kind of path and journey to success. So again, I think, you know, really pleasure having you on the show. Uh, really awesome conversation. Um, I think, you know, probably the, you know, one of the longest episodes we'll ever have. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I mean, it's not a bad thing. And it's, you know, I think the more knowledge we share, the more we talk, the better it is for the world. Um, the more uh, resources and the more knowledge people will gain. So many thanks, Katie, you know, Casey, Mike, as always, um, you know, I'm the first person you speak to in the day and the last person you speak to. So <laughs> I'm not sure how that goes. <laughs> so, but, uh, for the audience out there, tune in every two weeks for episode um, 401 Access tonight. Subscribe, you know, get in touch with us, share your feedback and let us know what you'd like to hear. So um, out there, stay safe, stay secure and uh, keep learning. Thank you. Yep.